This is your Geometry Honors Chapter 9 review video. So in this problem, they tell me that DEFC is our pre-image and RQTS is our image. So this is the before, this is our after. They want to know what is the image of DE? So where does this segment go? Now, if you look at the picture, you can kind of see what's happening to it, but it can be a little bit confusing, especially with some triangles. It's really hard to tell. So I want to teach you a foolproof way of doing this. If they state the names in the sentence, those names are given in a very special order. So all you have to do is you have to identify that D and E are the first two letters of this name. So then your answer needs to be the first two letters of this name. So the answer, the image of DE is R. Q. All right, so here they've given us a rule for a translation. It's x, y goes to x minus 3, y plus 5. Now what this means is since my x tells me left and right, I need to go left by 3. My y tells me up and down, so I need to go up by 5. So I'm going to take each of these points, a, b, and c, and I'm going to move them over 3 and up 5. Now because they don't fall exactly on the vertices or the uh, like exactly on the grid, I'm going to have to kind of estimate a little bit here, but I'm going to go left 3, up 5. So from A, I go left 3, up 5. And I'm going to be off my grid too, but that's going to be my new A, which I call A prime. My new B, I go over 3, and then I go up 5, which puts me right there, B prime. And then C, I go over 3, up 5, I'm right there, that's C prime. And then once we're done moving each of our three points, we connect our dots, and we have our new triangle. All right, here they give us a rule. They want us to explain in rule in words what this rule means. So we just kind of did that in the last example. We know that X tells us whether we're going left or right, and Y tells us whether we're going up or down. So we just have to state, well, negative seven means I'm going left by seven, and then negative seven Y means I'm going down by seven. So that's all we need to do is describe it in words. I'm going to move left 7 and then down 7. All right, Lakeisha was sitting in seat J1 at a soccer game when she discovered her ticket was for seat D4. Write a rule to describe the translation needed to put her in her proper seat. Okay, so if you think about like a soccer stadium, um, the letters start lowest, like really close to the field, and they go up to like the nosebleeds. So if I have my seat is currently J, that's like way up here, right? We're going to say this is row J. And then closer, we have more rows. We're going to name all those. So I, H, G, F, E, D, C, and then B and A would be here. And then as you move in, you have like your aisle seat. Okay, so your first seat would be seat one, then seat two, then seat three, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is kind of, it's not a 3D image by any means, but it's kind of an idea of how stadiums work. Our A is like our closest to the field going up to J. So if Lakeisha is currently sitting in J1, she's currently at this seat right here, but she finds out that her ticket is actually for D4, which is down here. How can we get her to her new seat? Well, my X and Y values are going to tell me left, down, up, right. So I'm at least going to set up what my rule is going to look like. It's going to be X, Y goes to something with my X, something with my Y. 
So how is my x going to change? What am I going to have to do left and right? Well, in some way, shape, or form, I have to get from 1 to 4. So I'm going to have to move 1, 2, 3 spots to the right, which means plus 3. Vertically, somehow I'm going to have to get from j to d. So I have to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 rows down. It's because I'm moving down. I want subtracting 6. So this is your rule that would get Lakeisha from her old seat to her new seat. Okay, so here they just give us, um, in words, they want us to write the rule. So x, y goes to, my translation is going to be 2 units right, 9 units down. So x plus 2, because I'm going 2 to the right, y minus 9. So we talked about this in class, talking about the reflection across the y-axis. I want to write a rule that is going to describe that. And we talked about it in class, but what I'm going to do and what you should do on your test if you can't remember this is just kind of sketch out a picture. So I'm going to draw just random coordinate plane. I'm going to pick a random point. So let's pick this point here. I'm going to call that 4, negative 2. Okay, now if I reflect that across the y-axis, I need to go 1, 2, 3, 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. So my new point is negative 4, negative 2. So if you look at the difference between my original coordinates, 4, negative 2, and my end result coordinates, negative 4, negative 2, whenever you reflect over the y-axis, you change the sign that's on your x value. So here, if you're reflecting over the x-axis, you change the sign of your x value. So to show that in this rule, all we have to do is say, well, our y stays the same, but our x is going to change signs. Okay, here, the vertices of a triangle are P, Q, R, Name the vertices of the image reflected across the y-axis. So here I need to create a coordinate plane. This might be kind of difficult for me to do on here just because I don't know how accurate it will be. I'll try my hardest. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four. Hmm. Definitely need more space. What if I say I'm counting by twos? That would work. So this is really 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 2, 4, 6, 8, 2, 4, 6, 8, 2, 4, 6, 8. Okay, so now I'm going to plot my points using that coordinate plane. P is negative 2, negative 4. So that's P. Q is 2, negative 5. And R is negative 1, negative 8. Okay, name the vertices of the image reflected across the y-axis. So I want to reflect across the y-axis, which is this right here. This is my y-axis. So I'm going to reflect each of those three points. Okay, originally I had triangle PQR. Connect my dots. I'm going to still have a triangle. It's going to be called P prime, Q prime, R prime. And the way I'm going to get that is by taking each of these points and copying the distance onto the other side of our line of symmetry. Okay, so this is my line of reflection. I'm reflecting over the y-axis. I just moved R by one space and P by two. Q, I'm also going to move by 2. Okay, so these three blue dots are my new points. R prime, P prime, and Q prime. I just drew them in there. So that's visually what's happening. Okay, visually, I have this new shape. Now, I could have done this problem without ever drawing a picture. 
Okay, because we just decided that if you're reflecting across the y-axis, all you do is you change your x value. Ooh, the x value is sine. So p prime is going to be positive 2, negative 4. q prime is going to be negative 2, negative 5. And r prime is going to be positive 1, negative 8. So that problem is really that fast. If you recognize that all you have to do when you're reflecting across the y-axis is flip your sign on your x value. All right, here I'm looking for the rule to describe the translation from B to A. So how do I get from B to A? Well, my rule I know is going to be written something like x, y goes to some change in x and some change in y. So my change in x. Well, my x I need to get from here to here, so I'm going over to the right by 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. Yeah, just 4 because B is like in the middle of two lines and so is A. So I'm going over by 4 to the right, so plus 4. And now I have to figure out I'm definitely going up. So to get from B to A, I'm going to go up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Up, seven. All right, so here we're getting into rotation. I have this given hexagon and this triangle, and they tell me that they're regular, which is really important. I need to have regular, otherwise I can't calculate these central angles here. Okay, so it says the dashed line segments form 30 degree angles. That's really important. I'm going to write that into one of these so that we just don't forget about that. So one of these angles is going to be 30 degrees. So 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30 et cetera, through the whole thing. Find the image of OQ, so that's this line right here, after a rotation of 240 degrees about point O. Okay, so what we have to do here is we have to figure out if each of these lines or angles is 30 degrees, then how many times do I have to rotate this segment OQ to get a total of 240 degrees? To do that, take 240, divide by 30. You get 8. So you need to take the segment OQ and you need to rotate it 8 different 30 degree angles. Now what's also important is they didn't say which direction, clockwise or counterclockwise, so you have to remember that the default is counterclockwise. So I'm going to move this segment counterclockwise eight times. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So here, OH is my new segment. Number 10 says find the angle of rotation about O that maps P to G. So now they're not giving me the angle of rotation. They want me to figure it out. So I need to look at P and I need to look at G. And I see that to get from P to G, I'm going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 spaces. Oh, well, that's super convenient because we know that 8 times 30 is going to give us 240 degrees. So we need to go 240 degrees counterclockwise in order to get from P to G. In this picture, we're getting into uh, lines of symmetry, and we have a polygon here. It appears to be regular. It does not state that it is, but I know I tell you not to assume, but we're going to assume this is a regular polygon. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight sides. So this is an eight-sided shape which is an octagon, and we know that if we have a regular polygon, the number of lines of symmetry is equal to the number of sides. So I have eight lines of symmetry in this picture. If we draw them in, this isn't going to be very accurate, but we have one here, we have one here, here, and here. So we have one through all of our sides. Then we also have through our angles. I'm going to do that in another color. So there's one. 
there's one, there's one, and there's one. So there's your eight lines of symmetry. Okay, so we're given this interesting looking flower peace sign kind of shape. And it says that it has rotational symmetry, but they want you to find the angle of rotation that results in the image matching the original figure. So how far would I have to turn this thing to get back to this original figure? Now what you can do is you can identify that there's like these three main points, right? Those are the main like distinct points. I'm gonna take a full 360 and I'm gonna divide it by those three points, giving me 120 degrees. Every time you rotate 120 degrees, you will get back to the original figure. So each of these rotations are 120 degrees. And we know that because it has these three distinct points that you have to fall on, kind of like this triangle here. So I take 360 divided by three and I get 120. All right, so tell whether the three dimensional object has rotational symmetry about a line and or reflectional symmetry in a plane. All right, so we're thinking about a cop car. We're trying to figure out, is there any way we can slice a cop car so that I would have two congruent halves? Can I slice it down the middle, like between the driver's seat and like the back seat? No, that wouldn't work because I have like my front bumper. No, it's not gonna work. Okay, but what if I cut this thing just right smack dab down the middle, right like that through the entire car. That would be a line of symmetry, right? I would be able to have two congruent pieces. So this does have reflectional symmetry. But now we also have to think, can we somehow stick like a pencil? That's how we talked about it in class. If I stick a pencil or some rod of some sort through this car, is there anywhere I could place it where I can spin my car and get that to fall back on itself? And I can't think of anything. So I don't think it has rotational symmetry. I think it only has reflectional going straight down this middle right here. Okay, so here we're getting to dilations. and We have to be really, really careful to read the directions. The directions say the dashed line figure is is a dilation image. So dotted line, let's make a key. Dotted line is the image. The solid line is the pre-image. So let's look here, before, after. Before, after. Okay, so now that I know my before and after, the questions are pretty simple. Is the dilation an enlargement or a reduction? Okay, well, before, after, it got much bigger, so it's an enlargement. But I also have to state the scale factor. So this I have to think a little bit more. If I pick one side of my shape, I'm going to pick this one here. My original figure, my pre-image, has a distance of one. Okay, but my image has a distance of three for that side. Remember, we always put end result over original. So my end result was a length of three. My original was the length of one. So my scale factor is three over one. So this problem is talking about a camera lens and how you can zoom in and when you use that zoom, it creates a scale factor of five or five over one. So that's my scale factor. Remember your scale factor is equal to end result over original. So now if we're looking at the rest of this problem, it says if the new image is 47.5 millimeters wide, so that's your end result, your new image, 47.5 millimeters, what was the width of the previous image? That's what I need to know. So I now have this proportion. If you kind of eliminate this middle part here and just look at the 5 over 1 and the 47.5x, I can cross multiply. So I have 1 times 47.5 millimeters is 47.5 millimeters equals 5x. I divide by 5. 
I divide by 5, which gets me a value of 9.5 millimeters as my x. So originally, this was 9.5 millimeters, but when I used the camera lens, it became 47.5 millimeters wide. All right, this is a pretty simple problem. Is the following an isometry? I have my pre-image, I have my image. The answer, no. Why? They are the same shape, but they are not the same size. In order to have an isometry, you must have same shape, same size. Okay, so again, we're looking at dilations. And again, it says the dashed line triangle is the image. So dashed line is the image, and the solid line is the pre-image. What is the scale factor? Okay, so again, we're going to pick one of our sides of our triangle. It's easiest to use a side that falls directly on the grid so that you can count. So I'm going to use this side here and this side here. My pre-image is the solid line, which had a length of 4. My image had a length of 2. So end result over original. My end result was 2. My original was 4. So my scale factor is equal to 1 half or 2 over 4. So this problem is asking us to do a couple of things. First of all, there's quite a few triangles here, so we want to make sure we focus in on the ones that we're focused on for this particular problem. So JIG and DEF. Now it's asking us to determine whether this is a reflection, a translation, a rotation, or a glide reflection. So we talked about this in class and we know that certain transformations keep the orientation the same and certain ones flip it. We know reflections will flip the orientation. So if I look at these two triangles, Yes, the image does look different, but if you turn your head, the orientation hasn't changed. It is the same triangle, it's just been spun around. It hasn't been flipped. So I know that it is not a reflection, is not a glide reflection. Now the other thing I know is that it's not just a translation because it has turned. It's not just the same exact figure moved somewhere else. It has spun, it has been manipulated in some way. So I do know that this is a rotation. Now, I don't expect you to be able to determine where the center of rotation is at this point in time. Um, I just want you to be able to recognize that it is a rotation because the orientation stays the same, but I have manipulated it so that it's not just a translation. Okay, here, find the image of D first reflected across line L, then across line M. This is line L, this is line M. Sorry that that's kind of hard to see. So I'm going to take D. Let me get my black here. I'm going to take D and I'm going to reflect it over L. So I'm going to get something that looks like that. Then I'm going to take it and I'm going to reflect it across line M. I get something that looks like that. What's important for you to know is that when you reflect over these two lines, because they are parallel, that tells me that I really just have a translation. And the distance that I've moved is 2 LM. Whatever the distance is between these lines, we have moved double that. Okay, so here I'm looking to create the image for this translation right here, the rule tells me that I need to go left four and then down four. So I'm gonna take each of these vertices. I'm gonna start with A. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So I've gone down four over four and that's now A prime. For B, one, two, three, four. I just went left four, one, two, three, four. And down four creates B prime. And C is right there. I have C prime. I connect, oh, 
connect my dots. And I now have my new image, A prime, B prime, C prime. Okay, so here they tell us that we have a dilation. It's asking you for the center and the scale factor. Um, don't worry about the center. Let's just be concerned with the scale factor. Usually our center is just at the origin, which is zero, zero. So we're focusing in on the scale factor. Now here, this is kind of like one of the examples we did in class where none of our distances are like perfect on our axis. Here you're close. You do have right here on this grid, um, but your distances are not quite exact because these are halfway through. So we can kind of look here and I see that this is like one and a half. So the dashed line is 1.5 and the solid line is one, two, three, four, like four and a half. Okay, so the dashed triangle is the image. So this is the end result over the original. And if I take that and if I actually simplify those decimals, I do get a fraction of one over three. So that is my scale factor. And then like I said, don't worry about trying to find the center. Here I'm being asked to take this figure and by the figure they just mean these two lines here. And you wanna reflect it first over L, then over M. So first I'm gonna reflect that over L, then over M. So this here is your final result. And what you need to know is that you just reflected over two intersecting lines, which means this is really a rotation. And the angle of rotation is two times whatever this angle was here. Last one, we're looking at a tessellation. Does it have reflectional symmetry? So can I draw a line anywhere in this tessellation and have it fall directly on itself again? And actually, because all of these, it looks like they're bricks, because they're all like a little bit staggered, no matter where I put my line of symmetry, I'm not able to get it to fall exactly on itself again. So no, there is no reflectional symmetry.